I'm R. L. Lewis III. I will be giving a narrative on Highwayman art history, past, present, and future. The nickname Highwayman, Highwayman is the nickname given to Black Florida landscape painters from the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. These artists marketed to sell their art to banks, attorneys, businesses. They weren't allowed in museums or galleries, so they took their art directly to the people. There's 26 original Highwayman artists that will chronicle. There is 10 living today and seven still actively painting. R.L. Lewis Jr. is an original Highwayman artist. Uh, we hope the experience that you have with us today, albeit virtual, is tangible. Uh, there's a lot that can be said uh, about Highwayman art through museums and galleries, but it's a whole other thing to see an artist paint something live. So you will get a tangible experience today, a living Highwayman artist painting live before you. Now the artists carry with them similarities, ethnicity. Uh, these are all black artists. Uh, there's only one female in the group, and that's the late Mary Ann Carroll who passed last year. Uh, nevertheless, they carry similarities outside of ethnicity, that being geography. Most of the artists were born uh, in and around the Indian River Lagoon system, with the exception being Robert Butler, the late Robert Butler, who lived in Okeechobee, but painted for so many years in his career, his illustrious career, uh, in Lakeland. And he painted a lot of agricultural and farming scenes. And uh, outside of that, R.L. Lewis is the only of the original Highland artists born and raised in Brevard County. A lion's share of the artists are actually born in St. Lucie County, about 17 or more of those artists. And you have another five that I call the Gifford Five that are from Indian River County in the little subdivision called Gifford, Florida. Uh, now, the similarities don't end there. They painted similar scenes. Uh, most of them were in and around the Indian River Lagoon system. So many of the artists painted scenes that were indicative of, of course, where they were. Uh, You'll note when you go to exhibits and galleries and extravaganzas that many of the artists that tended to live close to one another tended to paint similar scenes or in similar likeness. Uh, this is not a family of artists, this is a class of artists. Uh, you have uh, brother tandems, the Newton brothers, there are three brothers in that, in that class, in, the, in that tandem of artists that are Highland, that being uh, Harold Newton, who is very much the most indelible of the Highland artists. He started painting as early as 1952, and his paintings are as aesthetically pleasing as anybody in the uh, Florida landscape painting uh, sphere. Uh, the wet on wet technique is what many of these artists uh, have painted. Uh, back to what I was saying about tandems, you have brother tandems, Willie Daniels and Johnny Daniels. Uh, the late Johnny Daniels being the youngest of the original Highland artists passed back in 2009. Uh, he has an older brother named Willie who's still alive. Uh, you also have in-laws. You have Isaac Knight and Al Black, who actually started painting in Isaac's backyard uh, on the same day at the same time, simultaneously. Uh, now, you do have friendships and relationships that are strong amongst these artists. Uh, R.L. Lewis painted with a gentleman by the name of S.M. Wells, and he and Wells painted in our backyard for more than 20 years. Uh, you do have... Uh, these artists being compared uh, to favorably to other classes of artists. Uh, the most indelible being the Hudson River School of Artists. That was America's first collective group of landscape painters that did just that, paint American themes and scenes, not European themes and scenes. And so many of these uh, Highwaymen artists have been compared favorably to the Hudson River School of Artists because of the similarities, uh, that being ethnicity, geography, uh, in, in things of that sort, they painted like scenes, that being the Florida landscapes and uh, the Hudson River School of Artists, they are, are obviously painted scenes in and around uh, where they were most familiar and uh, their art was most surprised. Uh, now, outside of this, let's get to the nickname. Uh, the nickname started in 1994 and it was coined by a collector by the name of Jim Fitch. And Jim Fitch uh, started to chronicle and identify these artists. Uh, and consequently, uh, the next year, 1995, uh, there was an article in the St. Pete Times by a writer with the St. Pete Times by the name of Jeff Klinkenberg. And Klinkenberg started to uh, uh, expound more on this identifiable name. And as a consequence, uh, 
like so many things, uh, anything that is appraised and ultimately apprised and collected has to have an identifiable name. Uh, before that point in time in history, uh, this particular uh, genre of artist did not have a nickname attached to it. And so this nickname gave it an identifiable way to be uh, identified, not only identified, but collected. Now, if you note in history, the nickname Highwayman has been used at least three times in American and uh, more specifically world history. When you think of Highwaymen uh, in the medieval times, uh, you're thinking about the English countryside where you have people that were uh, notorious bushwhackers and heavy robbers. Uh, so we go from that point to uh, the country singers and musicians, uh, Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, uh, these particular individuals were called highwaymen. Uh, they basically uh, made their way into uh, country music history uh, by painting their way through hunky tonk bars and what have you and making a name for themselves. Um, now, this particular class of artists, uh, the, high, the nickname highwaymen kind of takes them traveling the major states to sell their art directly to banks, attorneys, businesses. Uh, this particular art, in many cases, as you talk, as I've talked with many of the artists, uh, this art had a way of making them colorless because it was about the shared landscape. Um, and uh, the big misnomer uh, with the nickname is that they stood on the side of the road and sold their art. I uh, know they traveled to major thoroughfares to sell their art directly because their art wasn't essentially allowed in museums and galleries. And so as a consequence, they took their art uh, in grassroots form directly to people. Um, and I use the word art making them colorless. Uh, it was about relativity. Uh, people wanted where they lived to be painted. And so often we talk about, even in today's age, relativity. People want their backyard more than they want some anonymous scene from across country or, or around, from around the world. Now they might collect something when they travel, um, as memento, and in even some cases as a collectible. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we get an email attachments even today. Dear Mr. Lewis, I live, work, or play uh, in the middle of a picture. Can you paint it? And as a consequence, what's more, more in today's age is we do a lot of things uh, that are relative to our environment. As a matter of fact, our old Lewis's personal theme is to capture Florida as our history on canvas before it disappears. Now, as we segue back to 1995 and this uh, large uh, ad that was not ad, but this large article that was written in the same few times, we go from 1995 to 2001, where all of a sudden this art appraised value goes up tremendously. Um, and as a consequence, people are looking to identify the various artists that existed in this particular class of artists. They're being invited to museums and galleries like never before. Uh, by the time we segue to 1999, there is a quote-unquote Highwaymen reunion that was starting to take place in, of all places, uh, a little a place called Max and Meg's. Uh, it's no longer Max and Meg's. Uh, at this time, I, I mean, you know, it's still a bar, but the artists were attending Max and Meg's. Uh, in June, uh, first weekend in June of every year, where they had a quote unquote Highwaymen reunion. Uh, and you would have in this quaint bar as many as 5,000 people on a Saturday, 5 to 10,000 people coming to uh, salute this particular artist. Um, and there was a fundraiser attached to it uh, with the Lions Club, where the artist uh, donated small paintings. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, people got a chance to touch a little Florida art history early on. Now, um, as, as we segue to 2001, uh, we get into a Daytona Beach State College professor by the name of Gary Monroe. He writes the book identifying Alfred Hare as being um, uh, this particular artist that in many cases uh, inspired um, so many of the Highland artists in the full Fear series and uh, talked about how he made his way from uh, the service-related menial jobs to start them uh, before his untimely death in the early 70s. Uh, so we have a book out at that particular point in time, and this book uh, brings uh, an, a heightened awareness to this particular class of artists, uh, so much so that in 2004, 
March 24, 2004. These artists are all inducted in the Florida Artist Hall of Fame. Uh, they attend, those uh, who are available to attend, uh, attend uh, the ghostly RA Gray Building where uh, the then Governor Jeb Bush uh, crowned these artists uh, as members of, along with uh, the Secretary of um, Art. Uh, I, I'm not just saying that incorrectly. Uh, uh, Glenda Hood, at that particular point in time, handled the arts in the state of Florida. So they have a neat distinction. All of these artists uh, are sandwiched between Ernest Hemingway and Ray Charles. And what have you. Uh, so that's a nice distinction that they carry. Uh, they all carry with them throughout their uh, history, living or past. Uh, so many of the artists were featured in Southern Living, su Southern Living uh, Water's Edge Magazine, Coastal Living, um, LA Times, New York Times has written articles uh, identifying these artists. So the art has quietly made its way across the national sphere. Uh, so much so uh, that the Senate buildings uh, in, the in, in, in our nation's capital actually has for the longest time carried a running collection of pilot art. As a matter of fact, a collector by the name of Tony Hayden uh, started this particular uh, collection or a mass collection uh, with the then uh, uh, now deceased uh, former governor's Maria Childs. Uh, as a matter of fact, Maria Childs created the Florida House uh, in, in the congressional building. Florida is the only one that has its own house, and the Highland family sit there. Uh, so that's a that's a nice distinction that the artist carried. That, that you can get a, a glass of orange juice as well as get to do some. Uh, Florida art history as well. Uh, now, R.L. Lewis's personal distinction in this class of artists is that uh, in 2008, um, uh, the new president at that time, uh, uh, Barack Obama, has an R.L. Lewis painting uh, that for the longest time has been erect in the White House. Uh, so that's that's a nice individual distinction. Um, and all the artists do have a uh, Florida artist Hall of Fame trophy and what have you. Uh, now, uh, we're going to segue over, and RL is doing a background. Uh, as you can see, he's using uh, the wet on wet technique that is so very popular amongst uh, Florida landscape artists. Um, now, uh, that, that we call the Highland. Uh, now, many of you who have watched PBS or other program, public program, probably remember uh, Bob Ross, uh, painting in the 90s, the wet on wet technique. Uh, this distinction uh, that he carried as an artist is no different than what the Highland has long since been painted. Uh, he simply uh, brought the wet on wet technique, uh, as well as the German artist by the name of Alexander well before him, to the American mainstream. Uh, so the wet on wet technique is, is certainly something that he is, um, has long since perfected. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to him for a quick second and uh, he can tell you a little bit about. Uh, what is being created at the moment. Well, <clears throat> go ahead and talk a little bit more. I'm just doing the background. Uh, as soon as I, uh, those of you who are flat out artists or uh, aspiring artists, know that we start off uh, any given painting for the most part. Uh, so many of you start off with a background uh, and then you will consequently segue from there to a middle ground. Um, and then from there to the foreground, and the final pieces to the painting will be the overlapping quality uh, that, that you'll see existing uh, in a painting. Now, I'll say this about the wet on wet technique. Uh, the wet on wet technique uh, has uh, been practiced by this particular artist, not only with oils, but also with acrylics. Uh, and of course, uh, anyone who is a watercolor artist uh, knows that uh, you have to uh, keep the board moist in order to uh, paint uh, cooperatively and, and successfully. Uh, if you want the paints to cooperate and, and as it relates to watercolor, you must uh, keep the board uh, loose. Uh, so this is what you're doing now. Now the middle ground, uh, if you notice uh, what, what is painting now, what is, what is uh, created here is what we call a level of atmospheric perspective. This is going to help uh, give the painting its level of depth um, and 
So that's that should be on this particular painting. Good. So I'm going to give him a, a moment to speak now uh, that he's come to this particular point on the painting. And uh, I want to say this before he gives the word. Uh, if you would like to uh, reach us uh, via uh, the website, you can go to rllewisartist.net. Uh, if you want to email us, you can email us at rllewisartist at aol.com. Uh, anyone wanting to speak to a live voice, certainly reach us at area code 321 543 1919. Now, beyond the artist who painted today is more than just eye candy. These are original paintings that he has created um, in, in our recent uh, past, and uh, they are available for purchase if you so desire. Uh, our paintings range from a 5 by 7 inch painting to as large as a 48 by 60 inch painting. And you get what you want, as, as they say. You, you get more than what, what you desire if you have an individual commission request. Now, this particular artist is maybe a little more eccentric than some of the other high women. If you can count some of them painting mine, uh, he'll use anything from his finger to uh, paint clouds to uh, a two inch or four inch brush. And he might paint the whole painting with that one brush, depending on how he feels, uh, what kind of artistic groove he finds himself in. So we're going to let him speak. He is actually an extroverted personality. Uh, he, it, there's nothing about him that's introverted. So uh, go ahead and, and, and give our audience uh, a little something as to what you're doing. I like to see people. Well, and uh, they see you. <laughs> but I, I'm only doing what we call a background before I decide what I'm going to put in it. But I've already anticipated what I was going to put in this painting even before I started. Sometimes that's good to know where you're going. It takes the stress and and all the frustrations away. Uh, I would like to wonder if everybody can hear me. Yeah. If you can hear me. I don't want to fade out on you. But usually uh, all I'm doing now is the outlining, the silver lining on the clouds, if I'm going to have any clouds at all. Okay. So the first thing I did on this painting was to put in, uh, I use, of course, if I was going to give you an essay exam, I would have you to verbatim state exactly what I did from the start to finish. And the first thing I did, I painted the whole canvas with gesso. The whole thing lined it up with gesso. And it's not too runny. It's the consistency of these colors is about the consistency of Heinz ketchup, something of that nature, not too soft. Just to give you a little background. And I put, since I'm gonna kind of shade this into a slight light moonlight, I'm going to fade it into the dark, from light down to dark. Down below that, I put a little lavender uh, color in along the horizontal area in the painting. So what you have here, and then also created with the darker colors, a, a foreground right here. All of this here is the foreground. So what you have, you have three dimensions to this painting. This is your background. This is your middle ground, all that in there. If you look across the water, you will see all of this looks sort of fuzzy. And the reason for that is because of the thickness in the air. Um, I like to call it pollution. Well, I am mean thickness in the air. And, uh, and down below that is the this is the middle ground, this is the foreground. So now in this foreground, I gotta determine what I'm gonna to use to fill this up. And what I'm gonna put in it is called a composition. A composition simply means 
It means how well you put things together. If you're arranging flowers, you put it into a, a unified arrangement so that it is pleasing to the eye. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to put in a bush right along in here. And I'm going to overlay it over all this area. So, you know, you ever think you got to see? So we'll get, a, we'll get into R.L. Lewis's history. Um, we'll start with his formative uh, stages. He does have, coincidentally, a book out called The Journey. It was written in 2015. It's the first edition. And it was called A Journey Through the Eyes of Original Highland Artist R.L. Lewis. And in it, he goes from the beginning stages of his life all the way to contemporarily now. Uh, he got his start, he actually was born uh, literally uh, in and around the Indian River Lagoon system uh, in a little township called City Point, uh, which is just north of Cocoa, Florida. Uh, consequently, uh, a lot of the things that he paints today are indicative of uh, where he got his formative uh, start as a, as a, as a youth. Uh, he did attend historically black Monroe High School, uh, that being in Cocoa, Florida. There were three historically black schools that were designed for minority students who weren't allowed during the segregated period to attend uh, white schools, primarily white schools. So Monroe was in Cocoa, Florida. Uh, Gibson was in Titusville. And Stone uh, High School was in Melbourne, Florida. So he was uh, attending the school in the middle part of the county, the centrally located part of the county. Now, while there, um, he had injured himself playing football and was sent to the art class to get the elective credit during the 57-58 school year. And there he met a little white lady by the name of Albert Leisure. Now, Miss Leisure taught part-time at the three historically black schools in the county. And this chance meeting uh, ha happened as a consequence of him injuring himself playing football. And as a consequence, you have to go uh, you have to take another elective credit. Football was a part of the elective credits in school. So he wound up uh, taking an art class. Coincidentally, she was demonstrating, uh, she did an etching on how to create uh, an Indian River Lagoon scene of all things. Now, the Indian River uh, extends from uh, Palm Beach all the way to New Summer Beach. Those of you who are familiar with the Indian River Lagoon system, and as a consequence, uh, he immediately took to what she was doing and was able to uh, mimic in large part the etching of the Indian River Lagoon scene that she was creating before the class. Um, she, was, uh, she was alerted to his talents early on and the next time she came to class, she demonstrated how to uh, perform another Indian River Lagoon scene, uh, this time, uh, with a watercolor set. So the first painting, or first water landscape that he created during the 57 58 school year was as a consequence of uh, the guidance from Miss Leisure. Uh, from that point, um, she seemed to uh, have a fondness for him and his work, and she was always in his ear about how he could use his artistic ability uh, to advance himself in life. Uh, she even encouraged him to paint. Um, or, or do a drawing of the principal of the school, Mr. D.A. Brown. And uh, Mr. Brown uh, certainly did take note of that. Um, and ultimately, uh, as he was still in high school, uh, he was commissioned by um, a lady in the community to paint uh, his version of The Last Supper. Uh, she consequently paid him $2 for his efforts. Uh, so that's the first time he got paid for some work that he had done. Uh, now, toward the end of his high school uh, uh, career, uh, he was also uh, given a newspaper article from the Miami Herald and paid, and said, artist pays doctor bills with his art, and it was of all people, uh, the legendary Hollywood artist, uh, the pioneer of his class of artists, that being Harold Newton. So that was the first time he saw someone that looked like him and was doing something that he didn't think was uh, possible and it was very inspirational. Now, at the end of his high school career, one of his, his best friend's uncle uh, 
got in his ear and, and his buddy's ear about the police giving college a trial. And as a consequence, uh, they wound up uh, collectively going to historically black Edward Waters College in Jacksonville. It's still very much in existence. Uh, I believe there's 42 to 43 what we call HBCU institutions in America even today. That was, these institutions were designed uh, for students that weren't allowed to attend um, um, predominantly white schools during that time. So Edward Waters College was one of those institutions that was available. We attended Edward Waters for a year and a semester or so. And as a consequence, I uh, ran out of money and decided, like many youths during the 40s and 50s, early 60s, uh, to migrate north, uh, anywhere from Midwest or north. Uh, many black youths uh, migrated for economic opportunities. Uh, he was no different. Uh, thought he would go up and, and uh, wound up in Wildwood, New Jersey for a brief spot, uh, but ultimately wound up in Syracuse. Uh, working at the university hospital. While there, one of the university employees alerted him to the fact that the university subsidized the education of its employees and uh, said he didn't know what that word meant, but uh, decided to finish filling out the application because he wanted to get it to work. Uh, didn't know that he would be there for any length of time, was just trying to get enough money to maybe ultimately come back to Florida. Uh, but as a result of the hospital subsidy for a subsidized program, wound up attending Syracuse University for parts of three years, uh, studying some of the great artists of the world uh, with the intent on getting a degree in art education. Always says this didn't do much for his ability to paint Florida landscapes, but it did let him know that there were artists like Cezanne and Rembrandt of the world that he otherwise would never have known about. Um, ultimately comes back to Florida uh, in the mid 60s and attends Florida A&M his final year of school and gets that's where he subsequently gets his bachelor's degree. Now during this same time uh, if you know anything about a little Florida art history uh, the space age program was being created in Brevard County. Now, Brevard is 80 miles long and 18 miles wide so it's, it's in the top eight nine sidewise in, in the state of Florida of the 67 county. Uh, now, Brevard County was being called the Space Coast because of uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, advancements on the uh, space program uh, well before his untimely assassination. Uh, he started this program. Uh, that's why subsequently you have places uh, on the Space Coast called Satellite Beach, Florida, uh, obviously uh, with the intent on the space program that the names are, are largely based on what was occurring at that time. So now the Space Coast uh, now has uh, a nice mix of people coming from all over uh, the country to work uh, for these high-tech, in the high-tech high space uh, coast industries. Uh, it says that there was a, a large mix of people who was available to uh, consider buying a Florida landscape. Uh, during the same time, we started to hook up with S. N. Wells uh, Wells, uh, who was also an original Highland artist, had a brother um, that he had gone to Edward Waters College with, and that's how he ultimately met Wells um, before he left Edward Waters. And so they got together and they started painting together. Uh, did have in the late 60s, 67, 68, uh, a chance encounter with uh, Harold Newton. He said that did a long, uh, an awful lot for him as it relates to uh, perfecting his ability to paint Florida landscapes. Uh, Harold was very much on his game and uh, says that this encounter with him helped him to accelerate uh, his ability to paint uh, Florida landscapes. Um, also talks about using terms such as floating. Um, the he and Wells term uh, coined that phrase uh, where they would uh, specifically target areas in and around the Space Coast and for uh, citizens that they knew uh, would have the money to purchase a, a Florida landscape. Uh, during this same time, uh, in the mid 60s, 66, 67, he actually uh, acquired a position with Boeing. Uh, ultimately, before he was finished out uh, working for the space age industry, worked for Boeing and, uh, and, and did quite well. Uh, they wanted him to ultimately migrate 
to Seattle uh, as an illustrating resort. They wanted to migrate out west because they were building a space program also. Uh, but decided he didn't want to go that far, being a Florida kid, and uh, decided to teach school. Uh, he and one other Highland artist are the only two that use their artistic ability to get an education. Uh, that being Willie Regan. Um, Willie Regan and R.L. Lewis are the only oh. two Highland artists that use their artistic ability to get an education. He starts to teach school, and in his book he talks about the beaches where he actually ultimately taught. Um, and a lot of those individuals that uh, live in and around the beach communities, Cocoa Beach, Satellite Beach, Pasadena Air Force Base, uh, were his primary clients for, for the longest time. Um, and was very fond of his experiences uh, actually teaching in junior high uh, in, that, in that area for more than 20 years. Now, as we segue to uh, the 70s, and you get into the 70s, uh, late 70s, uh, all the way to the early 90s, before this was ever called Highland Art, uh, he taught anonymously, uh, teaching adult ed classes at night uh, as a way of moonlighting light beyond his regular position as a junior high teacher. And uh, it was called simply Paint Florida Landscapes with R.L. Lewis. Uh, and uh, so often uh, we run across people uh, pre pandemic uh, to do exhibits, uh, make appearances. Uh, we seem to always, on occasion or more on occasion, run into some of his proteges, uh, people that he talked to in that time period. Um, how to paint Florida landscapes and what have you. Says that that experience also helped him to become uh, extremely versatile as an artist uh, because as you're teaching uh, young adults uh, and, and older adults, they want more than just the landscape. They want a duck put in the scene. They want uh, anything uh, different than just the regular landscape. So it forces you to adjust and be more versatile as an artist. Uh, now, as we get into uh, the, the 80s, he uh, was participating in some of these same activities, uh, uh, selling his art uh, in and around um, the Space Coast, uh, the Orlando area. Uh, he has several stories that are chronicled in his book that are somewhat funny, but they're real. Uh, he was even during that time into relativity and giving people what they want, uh, always painting sights and scenes uh, that he thought uh, would draw. Um, on the, the mindset of the people. Uh, there are some Lewis's out there that are quite eccentric. Uh, as were some of the other Highland artists painted uh, Indian River Lagoon scenes, St. John's River scenes. Uh, a lot of these early river scenes had rocket launches in the back, and people giggle about that. And where does that idea come from? Well, I grew up on the Space Coast, so there was an occasional, occasional rocket launch. Uh, so we found a way to, to put them in the distance in the background and the paintings and what have you. Uh, so that's just the eccentricity of the artist. Um, now, uh, as, as we advance on this painting, you know, he's, he's put in some of the mangroves and what have you, um, and uh, is accelerating on, on, on this particular painting. Uh, if you have a question or comment, uh, I believe you should leave that in the, in the comment box, and um, we'll do our best to uh, answer your question. So I've gotten, <clears throat> I've gotten a little younger now, and I'm a little slow. I'm not as fast as I used to be. Notice the use of the palette knife here. Uh, the artist, many of which, uh, and you know, James, uh, usually when I teach, I am. Uh, oh, you see it pretty good. Mm -hmm. And usually when I gesture something, I mean, he's coming to relieve me. <laughs> you get in my face and say. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. <laughs> not ready. Don't ever let them know that. <laughs> um, let me. Do you want me to read it? See if any questions are in the the chat. Uh, I'm not halfway through. Okay. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna get it done. So don't you worry. Oh, no. I'm gonna get it done. Sure. I got to put you a palm tree in that picture too. Oh boy. Hmm. Come on, 
If anyone has any questions at this time, uh, you can ask them using the chat box or turn on your microphone. I will be happy to read them if you write them in the chat box. Want me to leave the chat box up to close it? Okay, I'll close it. Okay. I'm going to make this more slash painting. Yeah. I like to see people. Mm -hmm. I don't like talking to machine. <laughs> Let me see. I can put. Yeah, but you don't have to do that. I'll put them across the top. That helps. I see. But they're still kind of far away. All right. Okay. Don't worry about it. There you go. You gotta remember, I'm your least burden. <laughs> Never a burden. Always a burden. Next step here is, is, a, is a palm tree that we put in, in this particular uh, river scene. Oh, hi, Caroline. Um, my computer is frozen. The Zoom is frozen. But you can? Um, yeah, it's frozen with my microphone on. Can you uh, just do me a favor? And uh, there's a question. Do you mind just reading it? OK. Thanks. All right, looks like we have a few questions here. Um, the first one is, how many paintings do you know if that you've created personally? That's, that's, a, that's a tough question because uh, as this particular art still reigns in its renaissance uh, uh, period, this art in its renaissance age now. Uh, you know, there's been a rebirth since the mid '90s. Uh, you would have to say easily thousands. Uh, you're perhaps you're perhaps looking at the most prolific of the Highland artists uh, still living, and, and maybe even before that particular point. He thinks uh, uh, before the pandemic, we we had uh, designated exhibits uh, throughout the year, um, and in which case. Um, at one time, for a decade, we had a, a gallery, as well as the appearances, uh, and as well as the partnerships. Uh, so there were there were thousands of paintings that, that he's created. Uh, 
I, I think in our history, that's, I don't, I don't know how we could have ever possibly chronicled all of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think we, we've done our best to um, identify the people, places, and events that we've went, gone to. Uh, but but that's, that's, uh, that's a very tough question, but I'd say thousands. Wow, that's very impressive. Um, okay, we got another one that says, what motivated you to continue to do art in an environment where only the popular make a living by it? Well, an artist, uh, this particular artist, uh, uh, not only his distinction in this class of artists is that he's also taught art. So uh, I was listening to a lecture uh, um, by a guy who, was, who called himself an expert on Halloween art, which is fine. And he says that Lewis retired, and then ultimately he came back as the movement uh, uh, started to rage. And uh, him being the personality he is, he says, can I ask you a question? And the guy says, yes. He says, I'm Lewis, of course, as you know. He says, how does the guy who teaches people art retire from art? So I don't think he's uh, ever really retired from art, so it's, because it's his hobby also. I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Well, um, let, may I interrupt you? Definitely. I think I, I heard you say the motivation part of it. Did you say anything like that? What motivated us to? Uh, yes. Well, there was a little money made in it too. <laughs> you know, paint them fast, sell them cheap. Mm. That was made in it. See, it was not the art for the sake of art. It was, in some cases, art for survival. So if you've looked at some of the art at the Alta Maria, the cave art, you'll see they had plans. It's just like they planned the day. What, what part of the bison do you touch? Or what part of the bison do you hit? In order to uh, overcome that, that game that you're going after. So. It's a, it's a lot of interesting things. And then plus, I love the Florida. I love my Florida. And so I'm always motivated because of the beautiful scenes in Florida. If I, of course you can ask, ask uh, if I didn't clarify that, you can ask more questions. Next question, if you have one. Um, we got a few people just saying how incredible this is, and they loved watching you paint. Um, but if anyone else has a question, please, you know, you can unmute yourself and ask it now, or definitely put it in the chat bar. Well, you can ask, you can interrupt me anytime. You got to remember, I used to teach at junior high school. And when you're teaching in junior high school, you remember that you have no, there's no dull moments. You always have excitement, so you don't interrupt me at all. You just speak it. That's my style. You blurt out whatever you have to say. Any other questions or comments? In addition to what I just said, uh, I, I did have uh, sign painters train people how to do signs and things like that. And I had one of my students, and I had him make a, make a sign on the board. I put it above the board. I said, when the teacher is talking, don't talk while the teacher is talking. That's what I said. So I had a, a real fun time. Any questions concerning uh, artists, how an artist, where they went, where, where a lot of the artists sold their art, anything like that? Uh, So we have um, another question. Have you ever failed doing a piece and could not fix it? You know, that's that's often asked because uh, well before this pandemic, we used to do uh, classes and what have you. And this is a free verse painting that is being created. 
and you you're going to uh, not do as well as you want if you're trying to be too precise. Uh, and when I say free verse, he's just letting it flow right now uh, and, and taking it as it comes. If there is a quote unquote mistake, oftentimes we call that a happy accident. Uh, you paint through it and uh, you learn from uh, those experiences and um, uh, you get better as a result. You know, we always say the greater the challenge, the greater the victory. Uh, we're always on the way to another site or scene. Uh, so uh, I don't think you could dwell on it. Sure, somebody put their finger in the thing. You know, uh, let, let me interrupt a minute. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good comment you made. Um, You've got a call in the I used to. right now. <laughs> I'm, 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 I can't talk to you now. I'm down at the beach surfing. Okay, bye. Um, a, a comment to that is I used to teach, I had a class, I was teaching sculpture. And, uh, and I used to tell the students how to go into the, uh, the piece that I had designed for them. I was using cement and vermiculite. And using the vermiculite, it's semen, it softens it a lot. I said, now when you go for something and you make a mistake, see, we don't make mistakes in many cases. We learn valuable lessons. And so I said, when you make a mistake, whatever you were going for, that mistake might lend itself to something else. So you go for that. Just don't throw it away. You go for that. If you're making a stature and it turned out to be a, a person holding a, a walking cane, just go for whatever it lends itself to. You got to remember, you're not using nails and hammers. You just got to take it easy. So in painting, the same way. See, nobody ever know you made a mistake unless you blurt it out. Any other questions or comments? You notice in this painting there, there are details to be had. You've experienced the background, uh, the middle ground, and now we're into the foreground uh, and the details, the little, little highlights that is necessary to uh, this often overlooked by aspiring artists to, to complete this particular uh, piece. Uh, coincidentally, uh, this particular painting uh, is available to you if, if you so like to purchase it. Uh, again, we're appreciative to the Palm Beach Historical Society for having us here today. Uh, but at the same time, um, it is available to you. And uh, you can either email us or inbox them. And we'll make sure that, that uh, you can touch a little floor of our history if you so desire. Hopefully, in the, in the future, we can visit with you with the organization in person uh, and, and, and meet with you in person uh, for the experience of it all, not just to uh, quote unquote sell piece of art, but uh, we always got an awful lot out of engaging with people, um, more so than anything. So we're very thankful for this opportunity. And uh, view all, and uh, leave, leave your comments and what have you, if you so desire. But, He's close to wrapping this particular piece up uh, and putting some details in it. Um, and uh, we think it's a quality piece. You put the details in it. Well, I'm just a little bit. Little, little things. Little things that makes it interesting. And I, I was wondering uh, who your early influences were when you were first getting started in art. First got started, my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, when I say that, mm. my mother, she used to create a competition between my brother and I. And she told, oh, that's good. She's always encouraging us. And she used to read us little stories. In fact, my mother was a a teacher in many ways. She used to teach us little things, uh, stories. 
and I was fascinated over listening to that stuff. And, and, but she was uh, an influence in my life. Because, and because I only had one fan, and she'll say, oh, she'll call me in. she said, that is really nice. And she'd say that, and I'd get so full of being satisfied with what she said until I'll start another one. Okay. I like, I kind of like that, you know. And so I would uh, truly say that. So now, if we segue back to our earlier conversation with you, uh, one of the bigger influences as he got into his teenagers, teen stages, was, was Albert Allegiant. Uh, the little white lady that taught part time at three historically black school. Um, she had a, a positive effect. As a matter of fact, uh, something I didn't mention, uh, she was so enamored with his artistic abilities that she uh, attempted to uh, get him to go to, to the Berea School in Kentucky. It was an art school there, and she tried to encourage him to go there. But uh, his father, Robert Sr., worked for the railroad. And I don't think he made more than 40 to 50 bucks a week. And his mother was a seamstress, so he didn't envision or see that financially. Um, but uh, nevertheless, he was, was very much inspired by her. Um, later on, um, he met, uh, met up with Harold, who was famous with his brother Sam, uh, at a housing project in the, in the late 60s and 68. Uh, the housing project uh, was notorious for uh, some of its violence. Uh, the, he and his brother Harold and Sam were painting at Little Vietnam, as it was called. And they, they had the pallets out, and, and um, he and Wells slipped up on them um, and got a chance to um, experience, uh, as, as he called it, the Harold Newman experience. Uh, and if you get a chance to talk to any of these artists that are still living, many of them will point to Harold as being uh, uh, indelible because of his artistic. Now he was transcendent as a young man as an artist. Uh, and uh, he talks about him being very influential, his style as an artist. Uh, and, as a matter of fact, right now, the Tampa Museum, Tampa Museum of Art has a large running display of Halloween art right now. And I can guarantee you that uh, a lion's share of those paintings uh, will, will be Harold Lucas paintings. And, and, uh, probably have that collection. It, it, it goes on from started in late November and it ends in March to the display of Halloween art. Uh, and, uh, I don't know about the access right now because the pandemic, how, how much the flow of traffic is in and out of the museum, um, but that would be something you could probably look them up online. I know that the uh, display has existed uh, since um, the first Christmas before Thanksgiving. And um, we have actually three more questions. Uh, the first one, Florida landscape is your niche. Have you ever tried portrait painting? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, in his book, we talked about uh, him meeting Bob Vance. Uh, that's a place over in the middle of the state, uh, Longwood, which is next to Orlando. And uh, as a kid, you watch the TV and he's a vehicle, and he makes a comment, I'm going to go and see that guy. And he makes his way over to Bob Vance. And Bob Dance uh, had these commercials that uh, existed on TV in the Central Florida area. Uh, now, Central Florida uh, goes from Melbourne, more or less Melbourne, all the way to Ocala. It's a, a nice little area uh, where a lot of the viewing is the same when it comes to uh, major network TV. So, Bob Dance was a figure, a fixture, him and, and Art Brandon. So he goes over to Bob Dance and makes his way past all the salesmen and goes into his office. And Bob Dance at that time had a little dog called Buster, Buster the Wonder Dog. And uh, he convinces Bob that he wants to paint Buster and not only Buster but him. Hmm. Uh, he decided to have a vehicle uh, for 100 bucks below invoice just because he could paint uh, uh, his prized dog that he always had in a cake that was on his shoulder and in his arms during his uh, car advertising. Uh, and he, he winds up uh, getting a custom van from Bob Dance. Uh, painted a picture of Bob as well as uh, Buster the Wonder Dog. Uh, so those things, that was kind of like a hook for him as well. Uh, those two artists, uh, I can speak of uh, more specifically because I, I grew up around them. Uh, 
they uh, tended to be able to think other things. Uh, Wells uh, lives in Alabama now, and uh, doesn't paint anymore, but he painted a little bit of everything. Because uh, he was a minister, an evangelist, so he, he, he traveled all over the place. And uh, it's nothing for him to paint a jaybird or a red bird, uh, things that were different. Uh, those are things that got you into people's households, because if you could paint two people again, uh, that went a long way into it if you wanted to get a landscape in here. And um, the second question, what do you consider your signature elements that are unique to your paintings? Signature elements, what do you mean by signature elements? I, I'm not sure, um, but perhaps um, what makes uh, your paintings unique? How are they easily recognizable? The shading of light and dark. If you look at a Lewis, I would like to think, and that sounds a bit prejudiced, but um, he has great balance in his scene. Um, I can see that in this particular painting. Um, I, I've never seen him paint a dark painting. Even in, in a storm, in a stormy painting, there's light at the end. At the end, there's always balance in his scene. So I think I think that's probably if you put us put me in a dark room and ask me to identify one of his paintings, mm -hmm. have a telltale sign. But yes. Great in his scene. I see. And uh, was your mother also an art teacher? She was a seamstress. His mother was a seamstress. Mm. She, she came here from Mississippi. Uh, there was a, a white family that she uh, did all of their work, all of their seamstress work. Uh, and they um, had her come and go with them from Mississippi to Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, here's a comment and a question. I personally love the Moonlight Highwaymen paintings. Do you paint moonlight scenes often? It's a supply and demand. You paint, you paint uh, depending on geographically where you are, in Central Florida, South Florida, North Florida, uh, you'll change up the scenes. Um, some of you that are in the uh, South Florida area uh, may not have seen too many North Florida ball scenes by our work. The foliage, the, the red clay embankment. So when we're there, if we're in North Florida for any reason, uh, we might do a deer scene or a turkey scene because that's what the people see there. Mm -hmm. Well, let and, me just yeah. not break in. Yeah, I used to teach uh, in the adult education section at the college, the Boyd Community College at that time. We, uh, yeah, the Boyd Community College. Uh, I would let the people in the class dictate to me what they wanted to paint. Mm -hmm. For example, pelicans. And I would tell them to bring a picture of a pelican in. We would only do the, the upper part of the pelican. Mm -hmm. And we did things like that. It's like sing along with Mitch type thing. And as I moved the brush around, this is some scenery section. They would kind of follow. And then they break off. And every every one of those paintings become an individual painting. So um, so I did lighthouses. Just about it. it's a challenge. But what you do, you look at it and you figure it out, and we do it. And the mm -hmm. only problem would be to bring in a photograph. Now, unless you're doing something abstract, something that you want to come out of your head with, that's all right too. We had a uh, one lady who came in, and she was a neat little lady, a little brunette lady. And she did her pelican. She did the, once you captured a mask, and when she captured a mass of the pelican, then she put the body part on it. And guess what kind of hair does she get? She came in, she was very. She had one of those little duck butt hairdos, and I thought that was pretty interesting. And then I and guess what? When I looked at a pelican, guess what the pelican did? He had a duck butt hair on the back. I thought that was pretty cool. That was great. Yeah, some crazy people. Hmm. We we've also had an inquiry about the, the the price of this painting, and I know we're not doing a silent auction today. Um, but if you could message me um, uh, privately, uh, so I can let her know. Um, generally what the the price begins at for a painting uh, like this um so if you do have a silent auction 
um, I can let her know. Uh, would you like to know now? Sure. Uh, if you're comfortable with that um, and you're comfortable with um, doing that now, we, we can certainly do that as well. Specifically, a 16 by 20 retail anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 bucks. So, uh, even, if it, even in this planet, we have as many as 10, 16, 20 glasses, and they're all the three that are with us right now. So, that's a big, that's a big request. Now, if you were doing the silent auction, you start selling off the yard, they got the book. And you do the instruments at 10 bucks or more. And wherever it, wherever it rested at the end of the demonstration, you see that person getting, uh, you think, uh, a week to do the painting. But uh, that's typically the market. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not more. And in some cases, the artists sell to me for a little bit more. I like to think that our prices are reasonable. And, and uh, the common man, quote unquote, can set. I okay. Yeah, uh, some of that I, I couldn't hear. I'm sorry, um, but it would be great if you could put um, in the chat box perhaps uh, what you, you just told uh, the participants, or maybe uh, the cost of, of this painting, what this painting would start at um, in, the, in the chat box. Now? Can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, that, that's that's better. Okay, uh, you're talking sixteen twenty retails anywhere from a thousand to twelve hundred and fifty bucks. Oh okay, so this painting would start at about a thousand dollars. Bucks, and it'd be framed for you and personalized on the back if you so desire. Okay, great. Thank you. Any comments? What I'd like to do your group, though. I'd like to introduce the the tools I use, the things that I use in order to produce the painting. Would you like to do that? Yes, please. Um, I start out with a, this whole background started with a, with a three inch brush. And it is bristle, it's a soft bristle. It's imported. It was made in uh, China, I mean, uh, never mind, never mind where it was made. But anyway, uh, and I used a uh, uh, one and a half inch brush in order to produce the bushes or the bush, whatever you want to call it, rainbows or whatever. And I use uh, the liner brush here. It's to put some detail in, like the twigs and the branches and the trees, things of that nature. I use the uh, liner brush for that. And uh, I hope I'm not fading on you as I talk. And I use uh, the palette knife, as you know, uh, to mix, to apply the paint. Sometimes I can apply them on the, the board, put it on, let it fit, different areas. And I get the one that's bent like that, so you're not the same. Who on the thing when you're doing that? Because you can think of a lot of things. Um, this is a, this is a leaf. Where's my fan brush? I use the fan. But anyway, the fan can also be used to do palm fronds. This knife can be used to do the, uh, the little branches and out parts on the palm fronds. I call the leaves, I guess. And this is a good little brush 
to palm branches too. And the palette knife can also put in, put in, I hope you can hear me, the ripples in the water. So do that with it. Get some more light on there. I like to show light. And that's uh, one way to do use those. See, I use on these instruments in my hand. Sometimes I use a sponge for bushes and things like that. But they didn't, I didn't get to use this one. Um, you can now. Uh, if you ever use the, uh, a good leader will never get tied up with minor details. See, a good leader in your bunch, he uses what we call the power of delegation. And each one of these brushes are individual. I talk to them too sometimes. This one has a job to do, large area, large brush. Bushes and plants or whatever I just want to juggle in there. Shuffle around, toss it in there. I'll use this uh, one and a half inch a bristle brush. This one is, is well, this 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 uh, fan brush can be used as a multi-purpose brush. It can put your brushes in, leaves in. Also, you can design uh, trees, uh, limbs, whatever. And the knife again. Get one that you can, that can apply paint, not only apply the paint, but also remove paint. And it's the sponge that I showed you before. And you use plenty, plenty of paper towel. Plenty of paper towel. Get the one that would be, uh, what is that, what I want to say, biodegradable. I believe that's the word I want to use. But anyway, the one that can absorb more than the excess moisture and water and stuff like that. Don't get something that will biodegrade in your hand, like the toilet tissue or something like that. That's absolutely out of the question. And I think that um, it's always better to do less than to overdo. Okay? <laughs> And on another thing, always put your signature in from people. Say, well, you put it over here. Yeah, you put it over Put your signature in. You don't have to argue about it. Always. So I'm going to sign this. And I'm going to use, uh, what's my name? Arms. L. Ariel Lewis. What's that? The nail that you use. Well, we used to use nails uh, with the, because uh, they're scratching better. What he's referring to is the artists back in the day when they were doing classic oils um, in the 60s and 70s, they would sometimes use a, a small nail. To etch their name in or the on, the, on the king on the upset board on the upset board it's better that way because the uh, oils would just slowly dry oh my goodness what did i do i did that any other questions or comments as we wrapping this up Doesn't look like we have any other questions or comments at this time, uh, but if you are interested in purchasing this painting or one of uh, Robert's other paintings, his contact information is in the chat box. And um, if you are enjoying uh, this virtual lecture series, it would mean a lot to us if you can make a donation to support our programs. Uh, you can donate on our website by clicking in the chat bar. If you're not currently a member, or if your membership has expired, you can join by clicking the link in the chat box as well. Uh, again, we value your feedback. So if you have time, please complete the survey. The link is also in the chat box.
Um, are there any other questions uh, for Robert at this time? If not, uh, I want to personally thank uh, Robert for doing this. This has been uh, fascinating uh, and wonderful uh, for me. Uh, so thank you very much for doing this. Um, and our next lecture is on February 4th. Arlo Haskell uh, will be discussing his book, The Jews of Key West, Smugglers, Cigar Makers, and Revolutionaries. Uh, so I hope to see you there. Are there any other questions for Robert at this time? Yes, I put in a chat. Yes. Uh, did you put your, uh, your question in the chat? Yes, I did. Oh, do you, do you want to ask your question uh, over the microphone? Okay. Um, art is a, a personal craft where your material and you like have a respect because they don't really talk back that much. But when your audience see your work, um, how do you handle the, the, um, the comments sometimes where your audience don't really respect your, your, what you're doing while you're doing it, like the performance hard part of it? I think, I think uh, uh, you know, while we heard the phrase coming up, you go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Not everybody's going to like what you do, uh, but that should not stop you from uh, being you and performing on the level that you would like to perform. So I would always continue my craft. And there's so many art leagues and art associations uh, in our area, we have the Bar Cultural Alliance. So if you, uh, if your genre of art is watercolor, then these watercolor artists tend to hang together. And, you know, the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. So uh, if you paint with like artists, um, and you go to the places where they apprise your art, eventually you will gain the following that you desire and uh, you'll uh, go beyond uh, you know, any of the light criticism that exists. Uh, I also think that that's healthy to a degree. I think that criticism, uh, whether it be positive or negative, you know, any type of critique uh, should uh, motivate you. Uh, you know, the old saying, let your past be a motivator towards a better future. Whatever you don't like about your work, let it motivate you to uh, perform on a better level, to discover ways to uh, uh, improve yourself. I think I think uh, self improvement and self love uh, is everything. Uh, I I typically would would challenge you to not be overly concerned uh, with anything that anyone has to say about your work. Just concentrate on improving your work, uh, your craft, uh, and Make sure that you have a, a, a love or desire for what it is that you're you doing. Um, those, are, those are important things more so than anything. We thank you. We thank the Palm Beach Historical Society for inviting us to participate in this process. I always say that by doing so, you helped us to make a little for our history cooperatively with you. Uh, this will be indelible in our minds and hearts. Hopefully it's precedent setting and we'll get a chance to perform uh, before you once again, uh, maybe next time in person. Um, if um, we think that the Palm Beach Historical Society, we thank a lot of you for uh, giving us this opportunity to participate with you. Uh, thank you again. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and we have two comments. Thanks for sharing your talent with us and a fantastic presentation. So thanks again. and. Um, we appreciate it and uh, we'll certainly be in touch uh, and uh, be well and stay safe. Thank you. We look forward to your uh, continued success as an organization uh, and your health. Uh, it's extremely important to us both to stay healthy uh, so that we can look forward to seeing each other again. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, once again, uh, we, I hope to see you at the next uh, lecture series. So take care and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Happy New Year.